We are honored today to receive the word of God from one of, one of the greatest preachers, one of the greatest leaders that I am fortunate to know and to call a friend and brother. Um, Bishop Eric Garns, the one and only, there's no one like him on planted earth. No one, no one. We have this thing. I think we're about almost settled it for over the years because we've known each other for quite a few years now. I remember the first time I saw him, there's just something distinct about him. It has nothing to do with the fact that he's from Panama. Um, he's Panama. He can speak Spanish and, and English and tongues. And uh, he's very intelligent. Um, he... Um, He's a, uh, just a fascinating gentleman. And I know he's probably going to say something because we're friends and brothers. We laugh a lot, but we're so serious about the things of God. He's probably going to come up here and say something about my age, but I just want it to be noted that he and I are the very same age. <laughs> very same age, yes. We, uh, we, we will be in just a few months, okay. Um, some great things came out of the 60s, Bishop. He pastors a great church in Brooklyn, New York, Tabernacle of Praise Cathedral. And uh, I don't want to take any more of his time. I could say so much more about his great accomplishments, but I want you to welcome him once more. I do got to say this. I do got to say this. Um, when my mom passed a year ago um, and we came on the Friday evening service and I, as I was coming around, there Bishop Garns was standing and he couldn't, he couldn't attend the service that night, but there's something about the ministry of presence. He drove all the way from Brooklyn or wherever just to at least come. And that thing really, really touched me. I have folk in town that didn't show up, but I thank God for this man. He is full of the word of God. Uh, just look at your name and say, you better get ready. It's going to be electric in here. I want you, um, because he stepped away from his, his church to be with us today after being in Delaware on yesterday. And I want you to give him the greatest agape greeting that he's ever heard. I want them to hear it in Brooklyn. So let's receive now. Bishop Eric Garns. Put your hands together and give God a good hand clap. Come on. We've come out to worship and we've done just that. We've come out to clap and we've done just that. We've come out to sing and we have done just that. We've come out to dance and we have done just that. We have done everything to the best of our ability that we have come to do. We didn't get up just to be here. We came up to lift up the name of Jesus. And because we've done all of that, why don't we give Jesus one more good hand clap before the preaching word. Come on. You can do a lot better than that. What an honor to be in Agape, the place where unconditional love is at its best. Now your pastor is 100% correct. Number one, you need to give him a happy birthday first. Let me do that first. Give him a happy birthday first. Since you set this up, I'll be nice to you because these are your saints, I'll be nice. But he is older than I am and he fails to accept the reality of that, even by months, right? But listen, God is good because of the fact there's so many that arrive, that have not arrived to that number and don't look as good as we look in this number, as we. <laughs> Pastor, we wish you the best. We wish you a real good happy birthday. Feliz cumpleaños. 
<laughs> Mucho bendición tu cuerpo. In other words, many blessings to your body, to your life, to your mind. May you want for nothing. May God continuously show up and show out in your life. May he continuously make the devil a liar in your life. And everything that you so desire, may he bring it to pass. May you never want for anything. May every wicked enemy fall to the pit and find their way back to the pit of hell. May every angel of glory show up around, above, underneath, and on every side of your life because you have done well. We celebrate one more time. Put your hands together for your past. <laughs> to my brother that sung this morning, thank you for ministering to us. They say nine degrees of separation. We, to standing there real quickly, realize we have two, a good friend in mind in the Houston, Texas area. Would you do me a favor? Clap your hands in front of somebody real quickly and say, this is for you, do not get jealous. <laughs> My assignment, the word of God. Lift your Bibles high into the air. Very careful with my time and I'm careful with my assignment. We have done everything we said, now the book. Amen. Lift the book high, repeat after me, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I walk by faith and not by sight. So this morning, I commit to do everything that my Bible says for me to do. In Jesus' name, let the body of Christ say amen. amen. Remain standing and open your Bible, please, with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. I want to read in your hearing verses 26 to 28 from the NIV version. If you're reading KJV, I'm reading NIV so that you think and know that I can read. Romans 8, 26 to 28 reads in NIV. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Final verse, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Father, bless your word afresh. Cause it to come alive again in our spirit. Open our hearts to be receptive and our ears to hear. For this we are more than grateful. And in the body of Christ, we declare aloud Amen. Amen. Kindly take your seat, please, and render me your attention for the next few moments. And look at the person next to you as you take your seat and say these words. Define good. Define good. Look at somebody else and say those words. I need you. Come on, say these words. I need you to define good. By the act of human nature and immediate response to most of us, when we hear the word or the verbiage good, we automatically, with the finite mind we work with, comprehend this word in the manner of something that we are going to enjoy, something that is going to make you smile, something that is going to allow you to skip and to rejoice because by nature of the word and our exposure to the word it is our understanding that the word good comes with something palatable what is about to bring to, I will, about to bring to your attention however is that with this good the definition also comes beside a smile and approval if something is good you're somewhat approving even before you physically or verbally state it. 
The idea that it's good in the context of the definition allows you to believe it's pleasing, makes you believe it is, has positive qualities. The idea that it's good allows you to believe that everything concerning it is going to be that which makes me also emotionally feel good. May I suggest, oh, however, that things that are good don't always look good. Things that are good don't always taste good. If we look back and remember that there are times our parents would have given us castor oil. It did not taste good, but it has the qualities for the result of it to make you feel good. That after you have tasted a bad supplement, it is afterwards your body starts coming back up. May I suggest some of us might have considered the usage of Buckley's. Anybody remember Buckley's or not? Okay. Buckley's was not what we will call your nice tasting atmosphere. The very smell could cause you to throw up. <clears throat> However, Buckley's, as strong as it was, released the nasal passages and the throat area, and all of a sudden you started feeling good. Didn't taste good, but it result made you feel good. If these are the definition to consider good, then what do we also do with better? If good is good, normally by natural definition, we create the gradient, this was good, but this is better. But better classifies good, even though good is a content or an ingredient of the better, good is still good and really cannot be equated with better. Because when God said he is Good. He never indicated he was better. He indicated he was good. And that no human being, nobody is good but God. He didn't give what we define good with being a lesser than to better. He placed himself in one solid category that allows him not to be equated with anyone or anything and on if good is defined as admirable and good is defined as pleasing and good is defined as superior and have positive qualities and you do it according to the human definition it makes me question Psalm 119 and verse 71 it makes me question what David was meaning when he said it was good for me to be afflicted so that I may learn your decrees. It was good for me to be afflicted. If using the definitions of which I've laid out just now, David is saying it was pleasurable and admirable and pleasing for me to have been afflicted. I'm therefore concerned how good and afflicted are in the same sentence. There's a, there's a dichotomy there. Exactly how does this thing work? How does good being pleasing and afflicted being challenging end up in the same sentence and affliction gets defined as good? You see, we've recited scripture quite often, this one particularly also, have we stopped to think what God was really saying since good is in the sentence? When you study the text, you'll find out that the term affliction at its best in the Hebrew setting means to be browbitten, means to be troubled, abased, chastened, defiled, hurt, weakened, depressed. So is the text actually saying it's good, pleasurable, fantastic, admirable, pleasing that I was browbitten, humble, weakened, and depressed? 
What actually is the text saying? Yes, may I suggest the text is saying more than our normal definition of good. It is actually letting us know we are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. The text is bringing to our understanding we are perplexed, but not despair. The text is bringing to our understanding that we are, might feel abandoned, but not struck down and definitely not destroyed. And therefore, we as the members of the body of Christ do not lose heart. No, because outwardly we are wasting away as our age continues to chronologically increase. But inwardly we are growing daily so that we become stronger in the midst of an afflicted situation. Where I was in the past is not where I am in the present. Where what I would have went through or what I went through in the past and how I would have handled it is different to where I am currently and meeting me now with wisdom allows me to handle it completely different. I would have cussed you out in the past. Don't sit there that quiet on me right there on that note. Look at somebody that knows what I'm talking about. Look at somebody that I would have cussed you out in the past. I would have laid you to rest. I would have put my fist down your throat and asked God forgiveness later. Any real people in here? But tell somebody God is good. He's good because he's worked on me inwardly so that I can portray a difference about him outwardly. You'd be why? Because even in the midst of all that I've been through, I found out that the scraping, the affliction, the hard times, the challenges, the problems, the inconsistencies that happened in life did not take me out. What they did was they grew me in God to love God more than I thought I would love him. In the natural, when I'm being afflicted, it could cause my emotions to be disturbed with God. Yes, it does. In the natural, when I'm being afflicted, I might not want to lift my hands and praise God because I begin to define that the affliction is working against me and that the devil is coming at me. When in reality, David understood it was good that I had been afflicted because the afflictions really even if it is meant for evil God can turn it for good you see because it's trouble and challenges that define that I have been through something we have in this primary value of age make people believe that suffering is bad We've made people believe that if you suffer, God is against you. If you are going through something, you must have done something wrong to God that has made you to be in the condition you are in. May I suggest that theology is completely erroneous. If that's the case, then Job, in the first portion of his text, would be an opposite to what God said. Chapter 1 says he's a good, perfect, and upright man. Chapter 2, he's starting to suffer and for nothing that he did. If that was true, then even Jesus would not be here. Because at the end of the day, they say, what did this man do that he ends up on a cross? So I suggest to you that scrapings really becomes more a testimony to let people know you've been through some stuff. Pain and challenges lets people know you have had your day of hard roads, hard day of pressure, hard day of challenges, and your emotional pain should not draw you away from God it should draw you to God 
Because if you have been a child and everyone is a child before you become an adult, you have to have some scrapes. If I look at your knees and going down to your feet and I see a perfect clean knee, no scrape, no scar, you haven't had a good childhood. I'm setting the foundation here. Look at somebody and say, do you have any scrapes? I, I need to see a scar here or there. I, I need to see a mark that reminds you of a fight you got into when you were in 10 years old and 15. I need to see some type of wound, hear some type of testimony because you cannot really preach to anybody if you have not been through some stuff. Your testimony of God is good, meaning it's an apple pie life is not palatable for me. Your testimony of God is good, meaning that you've had no problems whatsoever is not good for me. Your testimony that you have been through hell and high water, your testimony that you have been divorced and you're still in your right mind, your testimony that you have been backstabbed and betrayed and ripped apart and you can still find your way to the house of God. Look at somebody and tell them God is good. God becomes good when your testimony becomes bad. Oh, I'm not going to be before you long, but I got to say that again. Look at somebody and say, God becomes good when your testimony has bad in it. It has to be because had it not been for God on my side, where would I be? Had it not been for God loving me, I wouldn't even be able to sit in the house of God. Had it not been for God loving me, I might have been in jail by now. Yes, you have. Some of the things that you've been through, you could have been in jail. You might have boiled hot water and hot oil and poured it all over him. And then you'd have been behind the bars. Don't act like you ain't been there. You might have had somebody, paid somebody to get rid of him after he lied to you and told you all of what he was going to do and end up in another marriage instead of you. You know God has been good. Look at somebody and say, God's been good. Psalm 119 says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. <laughs> before I was afflicted, I would have gone down the wrong road, but because your word has become a part of my life, your word has become the lamp unto my feet and the light unto my pathway. I have a better way of looking at life. Psalm 119 and 75 said, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that your faithfulness is good to the afflicted. I know that you know how to look out for the afflicted. You know how to make sure that those of us who are afflicted according to text, hurt, humiliated, suffer, pain, are kept in the midst of the pain. You have a way of making sure that even if we're in a pit, you supply us in the pit. You did it for Joseph. You did exactly that. You showed Joseph a glimpse of his life. And he had a dream and then got beyond himself. And then jealous spirits came all around him that he ended up in a pit, ended up afflicted, ended up hurt, ended up with pressure. You put the man in irons and made people forget about him. But you had his life mapped out that even while he was afflicted, he did not lose faith in his God. And you got him to the end when he could have held malice in his heart toward his brothers. You made him remember you were good, that he didn't die in the pit. You made 
he remember you are good when the baker forgot about him in the prison and he was still alive you made him know you were good when Potiphar's wife came against him with her ugly self and caused him to end up in jail for not giving her the goods that she wanted you made him remember you were good Look at somebody and tell him God is good. He's good. Even David went through it. You use David in Psalm 89 and 22 when David understands the affliction of the wicked. He understands the affliction of rejection. You made David remember how good you were. When his father did not think he was good enough for Samuel to pour the oil on him and let all his brothers walked before him and never thought David could be the one. You made David remember he was good when Saul was coming after him to kill him and David remembered God was good when he said touch not the Lord's anointed. It's not that he couldn't kill Saul. Look at somebody and say it's not that I couldn't slap you. It's I made the decision not to, to slap you. It's not that I couldn't get into a fight outside. I made the decision not to get into a fight. It's not that I couldn't have resigned. I made the decision not to resign. I made the decision because I realized God is so good to me that in all of I have done, he has made sure I land on my feet. He made sure that the stability of my mind is settled in him. He made sure that I can still climb every mountain in spite of how high it goes. Why? Because God is May I suggest to you in the medium of my text here that suffering is meant to drive you away from sin. Amen. Shall I say that again? Suffering is made to drive you away from sin. Affliction also, on the other hand, teaches us God's ways. It's because I've been afflicted, I learned to pray. It's because I've been afflicted, I learned to fast. It's because I've been afflicted, I learned to praise. It's because I've been afflicted, I learned to worship. It's because I've been afflicted, I found out how good it is to sing. Even if I didn't keep the keys, I sung from the bottom of my heart. I learned that the hardship and the affliction and the suffering also brought me to a level of patience. I found that the affliction brought me to a place of peace that passed all understanding. And instead of driving me to sin, and it drove me away from sin, affliction also drove me to God and affliction drove me to God's word it is in his word I found out he's my light and my salvation it's in his word I found out that I am the keeper by the kept of the Holy Ghost I, it is his word that has helped me to stand on my feet because he himself is his word why do you think I keep coming to church promise you it's not to see you why do you think I keep coming to church I promise you it's not the praise team why do you think I keep coming to church I promise you it's not the choir I come because the word of God is preached I come because the word is what strengthens me I come because the word is what builds up my faith I come because the word is what helped me remember God is good it it is the word of God that keeps me on my toes. It is the word of God that builds my faith. It is the word of God that instead of losing my mind, I keep my mind on him who has promised to keep my mind in perfect peace. Somebody put your hands together for the word. If God is good, why does he allow me to suffer? 
if God is good, why does he allow me to be afflicted so that I might learn his statues? So that I might find out the things that he's done is better than human beings can help me. You see, if I had not been sick, I wouldn't know that the healing takes place. If I didn't go through some challenges and have to stand in front of a judge, I wouldn't know how much of a lawyer he could be when the money was drying up and I had to find another set of monies and lawyers robbing me left and right and they keep asking for more money. The more sentence they write, the more money they want. But then when you look up to the hills from whence cometh your help, knowing that your help comes from the Lord, that's when you remember God is good, that when there was no money and money was acting funny God will show up just at the right time when an eviction note was supposed to come but God turned the thing completely around and God showed up and you're still in the apartment when you thought you were going to lose the mortgage and God showed up and he brought you out and you're still in your house give three people a high five and tell them define God Define good, define good. Give me about five more minutes. Define good. You got to define good. What you're talking about, God is good. Just because you have money in your pocket, you mean God is only good because you drove up in a Mercedes? You mean God is only good because clothes is on your back? You have no idea. It's better than this superficial stuff. This is material stuff. This is stuff that will disintegrate. You got to bless him when things are going well. You got to bless him when hell is breaking loose. You got to bless him when you're lying in a body in a hospital and doctors don't know what to do and they give you over to die and here you are lying there looking up saying God is good. That's when you remember that your God can heal. Your God can deliver. Your God can give you a breakthrough. Look at somebody and say, hold on. God is good. Give somebody else and say, hold on. God is good. Give him a hand clap of praise. Surely this affliction, I'm almost through. Surely this affliction shall process itself, but it will not kill me. That's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 1 and 25. When he got to Hosea 5 and 15, surely as plowing of the ground kills the weeds and a harrowing breaks the hard clouds, so these afflictions shall kill my sins and yet soften my heart. Psalm 119 says, surely as the plaster draws out the infectious core, so the affliction which are upon me draw me out of the core of pride, the core of self-love, the core of envy. Afflictions get me away from me, thinking about me. Afflictions take away my eye syndrome and remember to look at him. Afflictions takes me away from thinking about everything is all about me. We are so egocentric, it is ridiculous. If we learn to realize that some of the afflictions that you're going through has nothing to do with you. It has to do with you getting through it so somebody can see how good God has been. It has to be that you have gone through it so somebody's faith can be increased. It has to see that you go through it so somebody can say if you can do it, I can do it too. It's not just about you. It is always about him. The Bible says, Job 33 even said, surely by these affliction, the Lord will keep pride from my soul. Why? Because God has been so good. You see, I didn't die from what I went through. I'm still alive to give a testimony. And many of my enemies will not be dying anytime soon because I have to live to see the mess that they've put me through. 
They have to live. Listen, church, they have to live. They have to live. If somebody who's been wicked to you is about to know you ain't dying yet, don't you die. I speak life to you so that you can see how good God has been. You'll die when I tell you to die. But right now, you're going to live. If I am going to live, I'm going to live to declare the glory of God. I'm going to live to let the enemy know that God is on my side. I'm going to live. Look at somebody say live. Oh, you know you're going to live. I got to close. You're going to live because the text says it was not only good for me to be afflicted, but the scripture went further to say, ah, and we know. And look at somebody say, and we know. We know that all things work together for good. Why? Because when I don't know how to pray, the Spirit intercedes and prays for me. I don't always feel like praying. No, you can get holy and act like you so deep, but some days I don't feel like praying. Some days I don't even look, want to look at God because it seems like everybody else is getting blessed except me. I see some wicked folks that seems to be prospering. I see some wicked folks that appear to be doing better. I bring my tithes. I bring my offerings. I dedicate my life. I I join a ministry and it still seems like God is not showing up but I promise you church according to the word of God when you don't know how to pray you got to know the Holy Ghost will speak for you that's why you need the Holy Spirit so that he'll intercede on your wordless groan he'll tell himself about himself the Holy Spirit would say God is good and God will respond to the Holy Spirit yes I am and then the Holy Spirit while you're groaning would remind the Lord that you love the Lord and he'll intercede for the will of the Lord to operate on your behalf because the Bible says and we know look at somebody and say I know I'm not questioning it I'm not concerned about it I am settled I know that all things is working for my good God works it for the good of those who love him I love him I love him he loves me back I love him and he's working it out because I love him he's working it out because I'm in love with him he's working it out because he's got me on his mind and it's according to his purpose which means that even when I forget to love him even when I get upset with him in the depth of my heart he knows I love him but the emotions but the flesh gets in the way but when the flesh and my emotions which are the weaknesses of my spirit get in the way the Holy Ghost comes in and jumps in the middle hey God don't look at the flesh hey God Listen to him. Hey God, he's having a moment. Hey God, his flesh is in the way. But remember this, your blood covered his sins. Your blood covered his mess. Your blood put him in a better spot. Hey God, remember this man. He loves you. And when everybody has rejected you he loves you so work it out according to his purpose look at three folks and say he's working it out according to his purpose because God is good God is I will remember God is good I'm raising a 
child on one salary, but I'm making it. God is good. I might have got fired waiting on a new job, but I still have food on the table, clothes on my back, and more than anything else, I'm in my right mind. seeds good then you moved and you become fickle when better is something you run after that means you leave good because you think it's better but when you like God you're consistent you stay good good in the morning good in the noonday good at night good in the middle of the night good when it's raining Good when it's sunshine, good when you're divorced, good when you're separated, good when you're married, good when you're standing in front of a judge, good when you're at the doctor's office, he's just good, good, look at somebody, tell five folks, my God is good. Get home when I get home when I get home. 
nothing of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. I got to praise when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. I got to worship. Somebody open up your mouth. Tell your neighbor, excuse me. But I got to bless my God. I listen, listen, listen. That's a word you couldn't sit down on. Blessed today to receive such a word from the Lord. But I need to, I need to, I need to remind you of something. Uh, you know, there's that group of folk that can, they got sense enough to look back over their shoulders and see that God has been good to, to them. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works unto the children of men. But you can't, you can't stop there. You got to recognize not only did God move in your past and not only was God good in your past, but he's doing something right now. Tell your neighbor he's doing something right now. He's doing something right. He's working some things out right now. That's good, 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 good. But still you can't park there. You got to move on to this place I call a, a faith praise that not only do you look back, not only do you look now, but you look ahead. And I want to give you like 90 more seconds. Would you just look at somebody and say, this praise is not for the past, not for now, but this is for the future. Shake them, say, oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Come on, put a real praise on us. You got 90 more seconds. Come on. Let everybody, let everything that has breath. Come on, if you're going to clap, clap. If you're going to leap, leap. If you're going to dance, dance. Come on. That's it. Come on. Father. 
feel like going on. I feel like going on. Let it ring out. On every hand, I feel, I feel. I will go on. Come on, just throw up those hands and just declare it again. I feel like going on. Oh yeah, after receiving this word, God is good. I feel like going on. Oh yes, no trial. They'll come, but they'll pass away. Every hand, I feel like going on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Did not our hearts burn within? Let's thank God for Bishop Eric Carnes. May God strengthen you, Bishop. And replenish him. Man, I thank God for all that's been said and done in this house today. And I trust those of you who are here in person and those who are joining online can say as the psalmist my cup runs over and, and like I heard mother Elsie Shaw say quoting the dear old woman my cup run over and my saucer's very full that's overflow thank God for the overflow we're going to stand on this word. How many of you know after you receive a powerful word that you got an enemy that tries to steal that word? But we're not going to let him do that. Amen. We're going to meditate on this word. Throughout the week, we're going to use this word and reinforce it during our morning prayer call. So don't miss a prayer call 6.30 a.m. Tuesday through Friday. And I know God's going to meet us. Before we make our exit, uh, I want to give you who are here today and you who are viewing online an opportunity to receive this good God. Note, his goodness exceeds all of your badness. God's got more grace than you've got sin. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and confess with your mouth to agree with God as to what God has said concerning Jesus Christ, the Messiah. If you confess with your mouth, he is Lord, you will be saved. With the heart man believes, with the mouth confession is made. And whoever believes on the Lord Jesus, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus, Romans 10 and 13, shall be saved. I want everybody to just bow your heads for a moment. Just bow your heads for a moment. If you're here today, say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to be saved today, right now. If that's you, slip up your hand. Hold it high enough and long enough for me to spot it. Salvation comes to you today in the name of Jesus. Don't be ashamed to do it. Just lift up your hand. If you're viewing online, I can't see your hand, but, but just indicate. Put a raised hand there, emoji. And we pray for you. Church, help me to pray for those in person and those who are viewing online a prayer of salvation. Mean this from your heart so that it's not a meaningless or an insignificant script. Say, dear God, I come in Jesus' name. I repent of my sins. I turn from this world. I believe Jesus is risen from the dead with my mouth. I confess Jesus is Lord. Lord Jesus, take my life. Save me. 
deliver me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive your grace. I receive your gift. I receive salvation in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for saving me. And I vow this day to live for you for the rest of my life. Amen. Angels in heaven are rejoicing. Come on, saints, let's do the same. Thank you for watching. I trust that you were blessed by the message. And if indeed you were, would you do me a favor? Do all of us a favor. And I say thank you in advance. Take a moment right now and subscribe to our channel and share. And if in fact the message has blessed you, would you partner with us by sowing a kind and generous seed? Your partnership with us helps us to do what we do and spreading this gospel, good news of the kingdom to people everywhere. Thank you in advance and join us again next time.